29. And we're finally live. Wow, that was a slow one today. Come on, StreamYard. You got to get the get that quicker. Are you All sure right. Are hey, are you so slow? Maybe. I don't know. It's possibly it's me. Hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans. It's time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies. Fantastical a place fantasies. Where magic is king. <laughs> yes. The, where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. The podcast that puts the fun in dysfunction. So without further ado, first we're going to say that uh, Doc cannot help herself. She has hopped up on allergy meds. And uh, so, you know, just got to roll with it today. But uh, with that being said, obviously, if you read the title, we're here for a fireside chat. But before we talk about the topic, we're going to let our guests introduce themselves. So in alphabetical order, Mr. Ben Espen, can you tell us who you are, please? Sure thing, JR. I'm Ben Espen. I've got a blog with both hands where I do reviews of mostly science fiction and fantasy books, but I like to go back into the classics sometimes and delve into what makes my favorite kind of books what they are. It's it's worth reading. He makes everybody else feel smarter when he writes the uh, the reviews. So, oh, is that why right. you love and, him so uh, much, JR? <laughs> Yeah, it makes me sound You're smart when I read what he writes. I, I can... <laughs> Never I, I was. I walk into him all the time. Seeming to be smarter than you reasonable are. rates. Reasonable rates, guys. Maybe he should go straight <laughs> right now. So, I mean, he's got a, enough to do, but, you know, he's got like 12 kids or 14. I can never keep track. So, I mean, it's not like he doesn't uh, have I mean, a hobby. I can't either. <laughs> <laughs> Just go uh, we won't no. tell your kids you said that. My hip hurts just so thinking about that. And the other ladies listening probably too, too. But Miss Chloe Gardner, can you please introduce yourself? I said Gardner. It's Gardner. Gardner. I, I mispronounced it and I'm sorry. It's an easy mistake to make. I am Chloe Gardner. I write broad speculative fiction, science fiction, fantasy, urban fantasy, <laughs> anything. They can't stop me, so they don't. Um, I do all of it. Um, working on a, a giant fantasy universe presently and, and really into the, the, the way that you use a map to describe that world. It's a lot of fun. CK, you're not the only one with genre ADD. I she, love she's it. all over the place too, so you don't have to feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Speaking of Kate, can you introduce yourself if people didn't catch your episode, which was like just a couple weeks ago? Absolutely. I can do that. Uh, my name is Kate Corsack. Uh, I'm a fantasy author uh, started making maps for fantasy books and then eventually kind of got into the D&D community. Um, so I make mostly world maps and I love it. So it's mostly fantasy, but as JR said, I like to dabble into sci-fi and, and all the other fun stuff every now and then because who doesn't love that? <laughs> Everybody. I mean, if George Lucas can do it, you can write space fantasy too. All right, Mr. Matthew Bowman, can you tell us who you are? Well... Uh, in case you hadn't heard, my name is Matthew Bowman. Uh, I'm an editor, mostly, um, and um, I occasionally teach creative writing. Uh, I, I, I love just talking about stories. I will not shut up about them, which is why I'm here. Um, I have a website called NovelNinja.net, uh, though it hasn't actually been updated in quite some time because I had a uh, severe attack of marriage and then kids. Um, <laughs> And There's a so, solution for that, but it doesn't get any better. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tried the the uh, the number one solution marked alcohol, but it didn't seem to take. <laughs> no, the very long term cure for marriage is divorce, but it doesn't make it any easier. No, nah, nah, no, it doesn't, it doesn't solve those problems. Uh, then, then no, I, it just creates a whole new set. Then I wouldn't have my wife around, and I actually like her. Yeah. Well, that's really that's cool. always a plus. It's kind of. sweet. Um, and uh, I'm I'm currently uh, unpublished as an author, although I do have a a little serial that was being posted on Reddit until I uh, wound up sick a few months ago and haven't actually caught up since. Um, but uh, yeah, there you go. So so having talked with him in the pre-show, dear listener, he's the kind of author or kind of editor that made me write the blog post about my own first edit, which I called Tears of Blood or How I Learned to Bend Over and Take It Like a Man. <laughs> so, 
All right. Well, last but not least, we have Mr. He publishes as Mr. Michael Morton, but today he's going to be Mike because he's laid back like that. Yeah. Hey, it's uh, what seven o'clock in the evening for me, so it's uh, it's beer time. I wish I had a beer, but uh, yeah. Uh, so I'm Mike Morton. Uh, I write uh, military science fiction primarily, but I have uh, dabbled in fantasy, hard sci-fi, military supernatural. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm not going to try and pin myself down on any one genre. All right, but we do have to pin down the topic. So, uh, Doc, do you know what the topic is tonight? Since uh, you know you were no, you were, I wasn't paying attention to what okay. you were talking about. Well, I was listening to the author. Shall I draw you a map? Oh, oh, you're going to draw <laughs> oh, me a map? But awesome. Speaking of maps, that's, that is a topic. We we practiced that in the pre-show. I promise, people. It was a lot smoother <laughs> the first time, but I forgot to hit record. <laughs> um, so, so as we get started, I grew up reading fantasy, and all of the fantasy had to insert the dust jackets or the fold-out maps were a thing in mm -hmm. books. And so when we interviewed Kate and I looked at her website, her Instagram has all the maps she draws on ink art, uh, I started yeah. notice, realizing that I don't see those. Was it? Incarnate. Did incarnate. I get it wrong? Incarnate. There we go. Up. Honestly, uh, you, were, you were pretty close. So <laughs> Close enough for government work. We'll take nice. it. <laughs> she is. Uh, but so I realized I don't see as many maps. So first off, uh, to get the discussion started, um, what do you think the value of those maps are for both as us as who are the creatives and to people on the consuming side, the readers who just love to nerd out over these universes? Well, um, since any I don't ideas? Have anything I'll start with, um, I should I say that uh, maps are kind of like prologues. Uh, they should never be vital. They should never be something that you absolutely have mm -hmm. to be consulting every single moment in order to understand the story. Um, they are, there's something that introduces you. There's something that gives you extra context. Um, if someone wants to skip it, they're going to skip it. Uh, there are lots of people that will skip prologues. They see a prologue and they just skip right over it because they assume that there is nothing vital in it. Same thing with maps. They should be bonuses. They should give extra context. Uh, and one of the ways that you can entice someone to actually look at it all the time is just to make it really, really interesting. Uh, so, for example, one of the simplest maps that I've ever seen, but one of the most fascinating for me when I was uh, a young reader, was the map, the very first map that wasn't updated for a very long time in the Honor Harrington series. It was such a different kind of map. It is. And yet, it's utterly fascinating. You, you t can tell everything you need to know about the world uh, as you start it just from that. And yet, it doesn't need a whole lot of detail. I have it somewhere. I am that dork. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to, to piggyback on what, what Matt is saying, um, you know, if, if it's if you're going to have a map and you're going to use it to provide context, make sure it's readable. Mm -hmm. You know, the number of times that I've seen continent-spanning maps that have a whole bunch of locations on there that don't appear in the story at all, and yet there's one vital location where... Uh, who knows where it is? It might be in the crease in the spine. It just so happened to be in the middle of the map when, and so it landed there in the crease. Yeah, you know, I, I can't count the number of books I've gotten frustrated at where I'm trying to find this on the map because I love maps, and I want to see how it relates to everything else in the world. And where is it? Yeah, I think that one of the things is Jr. said that he's. I think there's been an ebb and a flow in maps. Like I remember them being very common. And then they went through where the only place basically you found them were like if you bought the supplemental books, like the Dragon Lover's Guide to Pern and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, but then I'm actually starting to see some of them, strangely enough, in Trad Pub because people are realizing with ebooks, if you want somebody buying the physical copy, you have to do something that increases the uh the production value of that map of that book and so like so here like i actually just grabbed one and for example here so for here, those that are listening we threw the uh the map i 
This is yeah, like from one of Naomi Novak's new her new series, the uh oh, the schoolmancer. And because oh, but in her is the map is, yeah, I mean it's a really great but it's a map of the school. It's and it's very important when you read this that this book that you understand where things are because it's the school is its own like evil villain. So that does say school romance, right? Yeah, it's okay. the school romance book one, deadly ed, a deadly education. Yeah, that's uh, that's from Eastern the, European mythology. It's always fun to see that one pop up. Yeah, and so I also shared one, uh, earlier. So this, for, for those that are listening earlier, I threw the map. We were able to find the uh, the universe map from Honor Harrington, which is basically an image of space with a bunch of dots trying to represent the three-dimensionality of space, which is sometimes difficult to depict in a flat image. But Well, the, the original one did not have that uh, star background. It was just some dots and circles. Oh, it was just dots and lines. It looked and like my geometry homework. It was, it was great. It, it told you exactly what you needed. The... The biggest gripe that I actually had about it was that for a very long time, it was not updated with all of the new things that had been introduced. And that was going to be my, happened and they my next on the point on this, that as as your series goes on, you, you want to have that nice, simple map to begin with. So you're not crowding out everything like what uh, uh, Ben was saying, but that as you get those new locations, you should have them represented on the map because otherwise people are going to be like, okay, well, well, where is this place? Yeah. How how far did they go to get there? I don't want to have to flip back through book three to try to count out how many days they were traveling on horseback or how Just many- Just your book to the Lit RPG community. They'll do it for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've been hanging out with them. They are an interesting crowd. It's intimidating. <laughs> Oh, I, I, I find it fun. Actually, when I showed up on Royal Road uh, years ago during the lockdowns, uh, they, they were like, oh, hail the editor. Someone has come to grace us. And I'm like, dude, I'm just, I, I'm here learning about your genre of stuff. But, you know, that's a different topic. But, no, I think it's actually really good. So do you think as creators who have all used maps that you're, you start with the map? Or where, where does the map enter in in your process? The series I'm working on now, the first thing I did was get a blank notebook and draw a map in it. It is not the, the first place that I always start. When I'm working in three-dimensional space, I tend to do a lot more hand wavium because we're talking faster than light travel and and a lot Time of- Time doesn't move like it should, less. neither does distance. Yeah, it, it it matters less. These are discrete places with random distances. Um, but when I've done real world, I'm sitting next to a map of the United States that I've literally drawn out the path that a set of characters followed over the course of 13 books. It's it looks like a murder map. Um, and then with my <laughs> with my fantasy series, that was the first thing I did because it's a city in the middle of a place that defines everything about the culture. And I want to know where all of the water is coming from and where all the trade is coming from and how did the people get here and how did they get out and, and distances and all of those things. And it's a way of keeping myself accountable to the world that I'm creating in the same way that a timeline works. And I don't, I don't put it into the book. Um, I could see myself putting together a, 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 a special edition years down the road where that's something that, readers have 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 demonstrated an interest in and I have it but I start with a map and I don't put it in the book at all because that's just how I keep myself grounded on where the story is maybe that's where all those supplementary so I use, came from is monetizing your notes <laughs> uh -huh. yeah I mean so if the works are approaching right I got nothing against that. So I approach it a little differently. So I write, because I write mill sci-fi, the battle stuff matters. And coming up in the army when I did, they they stressed and they harped on the pre-9-11 infantry, the concept of the uh, the sand table to plan your battles, mm -hmm. right? So you can represent it in three dimension. You could understand what was where. And so what I find is one, I have a general idea of what's going to be in the universe. And then I give it to someone else to make the map. Because if I 
make my own map to fit the battle, then you find every battle looks like Thermopylae or the defense of Troy or all the other <laughs> iconic ones, because why not? But if I let someone else make the map for me, then I have to get creative with the tactics to fit the actual terrain and not the other way around. But you're talking like a detailed do... area map, right? Yeah. Yeah, like... uh, actually, a world maps and detailed area maps. I do all of it. Mm -hmm. And I've included all of it in my books or my website. Do you Matt make it for me has become a vital part of the world building process. So kind of like what you were saying, Chloe, it's become like a, as I'm building the map, I'm building the world with it. Like as I'm crafting these continents and putting mountain ranges and whatever, I'm going, okay, how did this get here? Why is this here? What does this effect on the world have? Yeah. And that's how I think some of my favorite worlds have come about sure. is as I'm building that world, I'm going, okay, well, this ocean is kind of kind of weird looking. Why is it here? What is it named? What is it called? What is it? Why is it important? You know what I mean? So yours, you both use it kind of not just to build an accountability of like somebody would a timeline or a history of the world, but also to develop your anthropology. Culture flows from geography. Absolutely. Right, totally. Yeah. yeah, there's and actually a, uh, a thing from uh, th that used to be a, a standard uh, point of wisdom and anthropology about why is Europe so fractured? Um, and the, one of the conclusions was that it was divided in, into so many different places by geography. Mm -hmm. And that is not entirely the case because you can look at China and they also have similar geographic fracturing. Mm -hmm. um, and they're a much more homogenous culture than Europe. But there's still a lot of details that come into that and uh, sometimes the culture that goes into it matters as well the as the culture spreads through a particular area like what happened with western culture in europe um, then it gets shaped by that geography but there are other motivations that press against those geographic features yeah. so they kind of go hand in hand yeah what i which i find kind of weird <laughs> about this come from learning Middle Eastern and, and Jewish food, like culturally from that area. Um, there are a lot of similarities in their food because they grow all the same crops. Right. So, so one of the things so, to remember, though, is how often water is the basis for culture. Almost every, you know, pre-modern age city was built around a the fertile river crescents along the, the coasts because water is vital to life. And so that goes into it too. And I notice when people make maps, especially people doing D and D campaign type style maps, they often forget those bodies of water, the lakes, the rivers, mm -hmm. or, or they do them sort of ass backwards where it's like, it's flowing in the wrong direction. If you understand anything about geography. <laughs> well, uh, two points on, on that for me. Um, there was, uh, there was one time that my father actually, contributed to uh, a standard lecture that I would give at conventions back pre-COVID, you know, we were allowed to have fun, um, that uh, <laughs> I, I would I would give this uh, world building, uh, sort of a survey lecture uh, on, you know, here's a bunch of information to, to start world building. And one of the things that I mentioned was something that was actually uh, something that he taught in his class on, uh, on international crime. Um, uh, he was, a he's a retired, uh, Navy guy, intelligence officer, JAG, then worked for the FBI for a long time. Um, and then he was teaching at a, uh, at GW in DC. And, uh, I happened to sit in on one of his classes when he mentioned a little statistic in there that, uh, own that of all of the arable land in the world. Uh, sorry, the, the fertile land in the world, uh, the stuff that's really good for crops, only 1% of it is naturally in range of potable water. Hmm. The rest of it has to be irrigated in some way. And he was talking about that as in the terms of international threats and uh, how to protect your water supply. And I was looking at that and thinking, wow, that is a great little tidbit for fantasy world building. Mm-hmm. Because it's, I'm a history nerd. I already know water is very important. People grow up around water. But thinking about it in that sense, that only 1% of the, 
of the really fertile land is within range of easily accessed potable water. And then you think if you're starting to put in magic and the like, what can you do to bring that water closer to really fertile areas? So for example, here in the United States, I love throwing out this particular fact, one of the most fertile states in the United States is actually Idaho, which you don't yes. associate with that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But it's got that kind of soil, but not that kind of natural water. Almost every bit of their farming is only possible because of modern uh, irrigation techniques. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, uh, the, the second point, uh, which I actually have out of my mind now, maybe it'll come up again. Somebody else talk. <laughs> Well, to go off so does that, everybody so, um people but sorry to interrupt you jr uh people are gonna live where they can you know like yes you they, they're gonna try to find the fertile land in the water but when you have crowded places and you have people that are looking for places to go they're gonna live wherever they can live they're gonna find a way to do it and they'll make it happen and so to some extent too people can live wherever they want people can live in really harsh conditions because there's space you know? Yeah, you're just not going to find the big successful trading cities or anything else right, like that. Exactly. It's just going to be those those yeah. little towns and villages that mm -hmm. uh, make for great adventure locations mm -hmm. and and help give you some flavor of the area. You know the uh, mm -hmm. you know the the folks who live deep in the forest they're going to have an entirely different culture than the folks who live in the agrarian areas and the folks who live in the city. So yes, yeah, and great they're going to be more conditioned to fighting. Yeah, because they yeah. fight over stuff more often rather than cooperate to build bigger things. Or maybe maybe it is the opposite. Maybe because the conditions are so harsh, they have learned how to cooperate and prefer cooperation to fighting, mm -hmm. right? So it, it gives you a great opportunity to give flavor to whatever you're putting Absolutely. in that area. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, before we before that, Matthew, one of the words mentioned was the the potable water. For those that don't know that term, uh, I grew up a Navy brat, so I learned a lot of weird weird expressions. But it just means it's drinkable. Because obviously, if it's salty or brackish water, drinking that's probably bad for your health. Yeah, you'll see the signs. Unless you desalinate it. Your irrigation signs on lawns. Do not drink you know, non potable water. Yeah. Doesn't mean yeah. portable. All right. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> so the, the other point that I was going to mention was uh, was actually the importance of uh, of water travel as well. Uh, that mm -hmm. in <laughs> like medieval England, a huge amount of travel across England was done on rivers, um, and uh, and I was I was actually just remembering that because of a different kind of map that was out there to you know, bring up the topic that we're doing. Um, back in medieval England, you didn't normally have maps circulating, so if you needed to go on a long journey, you didn't actually consult a map. You had what was called an itinerary. Uh, so it would give a list of all the places that you're supposed to pass through. So you go to the next one on the list and then ask for directions to the next town. And so the, those itineraries would sometimes follow along rivers and sometimes wouldn't. It would depend on season, weather, uh, whether the, the, uh, the, the rivers are overflowing, um, you know, whether they're too dry things like that. Those sort of things can really change where someone goes and how fast they can go. So that's another point to, to think of for uh, for your maps and how people travel uh, in those areas. Because not every river is as wide as the Mississippi. Uh, some parts of the year, it's going to be really dry. I live really close to the, uh, the Red River in Texas, which isn't a river most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Matthew, that reminds me of something that, you know, when you look at a really old map, you know, like if you if you go back into ancient cartography, oftentimes the proportions look distorted to us with our modern map projections. One of the interesting things that I saw was that sometimes those maps can be corrected to look like ours if you take into account travel times from place mm -hmm. to place and that your your perception of your world <laughs> can be can be altered by how long it takes to get somewhere you know if it's an hour drive versus you know it, this is going to be several you know maybe a full day of walking right. it is a real different world and and so people's maps reflected that that actually just reminded me of a different kind of map that i'm i'm going to go look for it and give uh, jr a link in case he wants to put it up there while someone else talks 
I was going to say, I remember I had an NCO who had just PCS from Hawaii and she used to tell me in Hawaii, they tell, they have this proportion difference. They would tell you, oh, it's going to take you 30 minutes when it only took you like 10 to 15 because they, she's like, it's almost like they wanted the island to be bigger than it was. <laughs> So, it, but it was what you said about proportion r reminded me of what she was warning me of. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. It, it exists in reverse, oh. too, over in uh, continental Europe. Uh, my wife has family over there. And one of the things that they always tell their friends about mm -hmm. who haven't been to the United States is it's bigger than you think. Right. They, they, they will. The people will be making plans to visit the United States like, yeah, we're oh, yeah. Go they, to have, they have no World. idea. How far, yeah. How far we're going to the Disney park, World and then we'll go to Kansas City and then we'll go to Los Angeles. That's what he said. We'll do it in like three or four days. <laughs> oh, if, if, you, if you ever go so, on to Reddit into the uh, into the Ask an American subreddit, about 70 percent of the questions that are asked there can boil down to yes. The United States is big. Yep. <laughs> so one of the things we didn't talk about, okay. we've kind of implied maps or associated maps almost exclusively with sort of world maps and fantasy settings, but they have a, a role in sci-fi too. So I'm going to throw up on the screen you real talk quick. about sci-fi, space travel and three dimensions. Well, no, no, but uh, they also less map more schematic but There's they you know one of the ways they sometimes wanted us to say apparently no i'm just they, they maps in other genres can be just as useful like schematics of the building like you showed the school for instance you can see that in sci-fi too with like spaceships um or or you know building locations they just it's okay jr we they love look you more. anyways and because we're on the screen of maps. I'm going ahead and show some of uh, what Ink Carnet. I almost said Ink Carnet again. Ink Carnet can do from uh, from Kate's website. So if you like her work, she, she's for hire. But uh, now we'll get back to you <laughs> regularly. But yeah, so they there's a role <laughs> as an artist. Let's be yeah, she was like, but there's a role for there. Yeah, there's a role for for maps in all genres. I don't think because some people associate maps almost exclusively with with fantasy and i don't think that's necessarily true so oh, yeah we talked about the honor verse map we've that was already, the first one we talked about that was the first one we talked about it wasn't even like um mercedes lackey's valdemar series where the map is ever evolving and very important particularly once you get to the winds of fate trilogy yeah. not that i'm not a huge urban nerd right here's yeah. here's one of the earliest <laughs> versions of her uh of Belgarth map and it's grown yep. so much over the years. Hold on, hold on. Let me throw you on. Mike, can you? Uh, I'm gonna yes. Put you on the solo screen. Yes. There we go. You're my people, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I have got on the screen. Let me go to the map that uh, Matt sent me so I can share it. Most of the maps were done actually oh, by Larry wow. Dixon for that yeah. series. Mm -hmm. And he's he is the sweetest, nicest man. Yeah, so. yeah, he is. So this this is the one that. All I right. Was so this is of, the map. Uh, and it was a, uh, it was just because of what Ben said about how those maps can be corrected if you take into account travel times and such. Those little chunks right there are carved Inuit maps made out of driftwood. And they just show the relative locations of, uh, of geographical features along a coastline. Yeah. I found out about that one recently. It, I found it fascinating. That's super cool, Matt. That is awesome. Wow. So all of you guys you use maps and what you're doing. But where do you start with a map? Like, I mean, I, I've seen, oh, so I was in the SEA. And the SEA known world map is basically the United States on its side. And uh, which people are like, no, it's not. And then you show them and they're like, oh, it is. <laughs> uh, so where do so, you start? Amateurish and with great enthusiasm. <laughs> Honestly, yes. Absolutely. <laughs> never, I never. love that line. <laughs> 
whenever I get asked this question, I always feel like the answer is just really dumb. But the answer is like, I just kind of start and I see what happens. <laughs> you just start putting so, scoops on. In the other I have a some, friend who sometimes does. you have to throw what the map think? out because it doesn't work the way that you yeah. want it to. You just start oh, over. I have a friend who started a new series and she goes, what do you think of my map? And I'm like, those are really interesting cotton shapes. And she's like, they were coffee stains. Yep. <laughs> well, that's my favorite. I love the people that make fantasy maps with coffee stains, with rice. rice. Yeah. Yes, oh that gosh. is so cool. I love it. I love it so much. It makes my heart so happy. <laughs> I, I've seen it done with dice. You throw yes. a bunch of D6s yeah, out yeah, there. The, dice the, the face of number means a different map feature. That was how I oh, made wow. my very first map. And I was I was a child at the time and I had no idea of like like size of things or you know, going all out. So yeah. I took like a giant poster board that was about as big as I was and I threw like dice and toys and crap onto it and then I drew around it and that was my very first fantasy map. I eventually Ooh. remade it in Incarnate and it's one of my favorites, but it nice. was that is what I did. It I still have it rolled up somewhere in my house. It's like it's a big poster board. So there's, so real quick, since we've mentioned Incarnate, and I, man, I can never pronounce that right, but there's other programs. So there's the Industry Cartography Standard, which was Campaign Cartographer 3, CC3. It's very expensive. If you catch it a la carte or if you catch it on a sale, you can you can get it. I, I did. It's also kind of not idiot proof, and that's what I need in my computer programs. Uh, there's a another program, which if you're new that I recommend, which is called uh, Fractal Mapper. Although if you're looking as a creator, you do not, you cannot monetize. You can show it for free on your website, whatever you make. But if you wanted to sell that as content, that, that it's against their terms of service. Uh, the good thing about Fractal Mapper though, is when you have locations on a map, once you build, it will tell you once you, there's a feature where you can click point A and point B, it tells you exactly how many miles it is apart. So if you're planning a campaign, it's good to be able to keep track of that. I don't know if you can do that in, in the army, is it really? It is. I actually. I didn't know that. It, I, I have a friend who that was her job in the army was map making. Mostly, what it meant was looking up maps, printing them, and making sure they were updated when in theater. Mm -hmm. But it was she was technically an intelligence. Most modern army maps are literally just um, uh, satellite overlays. Yeah, that's part that's of making got. sure it's intelligence with it, it's it's up to date with all the accurate intelligence and uh she was very popular with the Rangers because she was very OCD. And th she had this great story of them bringing her a case of lobsters in the middle of the Iraq desert because they were so happy and I'm like okay. I've got questions but that's not this episode. So, uh, <laughs> so like do have value. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, so are you able to track distances, Kate, when you do it on the Incarnate? I don't think so. I feel like there's a lot of tools I'm still discovering with it. I've been using it for years, and I feel like they're constantly adding things. That I know of, you cannot. They have a path tool, but that's more just like for drawing like where roads are. And I don't <laughs> think it measures distance at all. So it's, um, it'll show you the Hobbit trail, but not the... Exactly. No, the reason, though, that I love Incarnate is because they have the free version. You don't have to download anything. And that's why I always tell people to start there, because there are other websites, like Wonderdraft. Wonderdraft is another one that a lot of fantasy map makers use, but it's you have to pay for it. It's not expensive at all. It's like 40 bucks, 35 something like that, a one-time payment. Um, but Incarnate has a free version, super limited, but it gives you worlds mountains, trees, the basic stuff that you need. And then if you realize you really like the program or you want to publish and you need the licensing to do that, you can upgrade to the pro and get so much stuff. So that's why that's where I started because I just, once again, I was a kid just looking for a free, something to do for free and I found it. And so that's why I like Incarnate. But there, well, there are a lot of other really good ones out there. So it's not the end all be all. <laughs> so Check, checking, if you're, uh, if you're uh, watching this on YouTube, we put up the name in the corner so that you can see I'll how I'll put it's it going. all in the show notes with website links. We'll be in the show I'll notes. Put everything in the show notes. We have fun. Well, checking on <laughs> so Incarnate, uh, there's actually a scale tutorial uh, that uh, there isn't a distance tool specifically, but at the different uh, scales that you're at, there is a standard amount uh, 
for what one inch equals. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're at the world level view, one inch equals 500 miles, for example. Okay. And that kind of stuff is useful for fans yeah. that want to track the progress too. Um, one of the things I will say that if you're looking for a universe map, uh, there's a f attachment that comes with, you can get with Fractal Mapper that will actually do solar systems. So you can have, you can populate in three dimensions, several solar systems, and it'll tell you how many light years everyone is. But, but it's only useful to you as a creator or as someone who's planning a campaign in like D and D, because how do you print that out in a book? I just don't know. <laughs> so you could always do a map scale on the bottom, but do you guys do those? I some of my maps do, some of them don't. It yeah, just, I mean, oh. it, it's un, un, unless it's a small enough map where the distances matter, mm -hmm. like like it's imperative that the main character gets from point A to point B in a certain amount of time, and you want to impress upon the reader just how difficult that's going to be. Um, it probably doesn't really matter. Again, the maps are are a bonus and add on. Uh, you know, I, I, in, in my book, uh, I thought about putting a map in there. It's, you know, it's a, it's a little sci-fi based in space. They're traveling between uh, planetary orbit, uh, uh, the, the moons, uh, the asteroid belt, the, the, the gas giants. I could easily put, you know, a, like a quarter map where it shows the different rings and stuff. But in the end, I decided, it, is it really going to add anything yeah. to the story? And I said, no, it's, it's just, you know, a I think for space, we all get that space is huge. So, like, giving the relative proportions, which you can do on a map without doing a unit of measurement, is very easy. I So, J we love to make fun of my dad on this podcast for his review of um, Lord of the Rings, where my dad woke up and went, are they still walking? Or did you plus them? <laughs> <laughs> he fell asleep during a... Uh, uh, he fell asleep! He fell asleep! We kept going, but it was, are they still walking? Did you pause the movie? Yeah. But one of the things, and somebody, it was a viral post a while ago where somebody put up a map of the United States and they went just for some perspective of how much walking they did. So yes, they're still walking. And, but so it was kind of I'm just saying, to yeah. understand the scope in a way, of what these people were accomplishing. And I'll tell you what that and, meant. And given what we... Cars. And given <laughs> what we know, I'm just saying those hobbits should have gotten skinnier the farther along they went. That's true. That was a lot of <laughs> they should have been little. So, if they were pausing for food so, that often, you know that's why they took forever. <laughs> so, so, Ben, I... Uh, I, second breakfast makes a lot more sense So in 11Zs. But, uh, so, yeah, Ben, I'm asking too. you this because you're the one who's here... A exclusively as a reader so obviously you can only put so much in a book in and you're even limited somewhat on the digital like ebook copy if uh if creatives were doing that because you know we have a mix of both listening well there's more on our website kind of thing and they they told you links would you actually as a reader do you care enough do you think you'd actually go look or you just want to see what's in the book oh no i would totally go look i mean i love that sort of thing i'm you know i I love maps just in and of themselves. So yeah, if there if there was an opportunity to to go look at something, I I would likely take that up. You know, like if it's if it's in a print book, I, I do love that. But if it was, hey, you know, you can go see this map here, go to my website, would I consider that? Yeah. Yeah, I very well might. You know, to give you an, an idea of how interested I am in maps, you know, if it's a book that's set in the real world, I will almost always go use and an online map to go look at the places yeah. and, and go map it out. And you like, depending on who the author is, some of them are real good at that. You like Tim Powers, for example, I was, I was reading force perspectives recently. He's a, you know, Tim Powers is a, a native Angelino and I live about eight hours from Los Angeles. So I know the area pretty well. And there was an area he described in the book and I'm like, I think I've been there. And I went and looked at the satellite map and I'm like, yeah, his description in the book matches the satellite map. And I bet I bet he had his wife drive him out there when he was like taking notes on his book. You know, like so like that's the level of mapping that I I'm mean, at. Google Streets View no, is awesome. No lie, that's how I found out where Robert Ross lived is uh which okay, that sounds very creepy now that I say yeah, that. I'm not but I'm not, not stalkery at all. Uh, but. No, but I literally messaged him <laughs> and I went, Where the hell do you live? 
because he was describing certain things, but also like the some of the seasonal Christmas holiday because it was a, a, a seasonal setting that happened very specifically to Roswell, Georgia. And it was like, either you've done your research or you live really close. And it turns out he lives less than 15 minutes from my house. So it was definitely like, I don't mean to sound creepy, but where the hell do you live? <laughs> Yeah, there's uh, there was one short I actually, story I did. It was uh, set in the Philippines, in, in the eve of World War II, December sixth, mm. and uh, so I actually went onto Google Maps, and it was a modern view of Middle East City, but at least it gave me an idea of how the streets were laid out. I, you know, I knew where my characters were starting. I knew where the bad guy was, so it gave me some idea of kind of what they were facing because it's not an American city. So I wanted a different perspective on how to describe it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, Mike. Yeah. So, do you when you guys think of maps? Obviously, we've talked about world maps, but maps can be a lot more specific and granular and narrowly focused. Do you guys tend to use them for that too? Like, you know, maybe what we would think of in D anD D is like the battle map, something a lot more focused. For writing, I don't. Uh, for D anD D, I feel like that's kind of a given. Uh, they're very <laughs> used. Every, everyone's used them. Um, but for writing, I'm the kind of person that I have my world scale. But when I'm writing scenes, um, especially when I'm drafting, it just I write it as I see it. And it's it's just a movie in my head. And that's really, you know, and then when I go back later, I go, oh, that's not possible. And I'll change stuff. But um, when I'm writing it, I'm not usually, unless once again, I'm referring to world travel where, okay, where are they going to be going next? Let me check my map. What city is closest? All right. They're going to stop there, whatever. But no, for like smaller scenes, I usually don't personally. Yeah. So what if I'm writing a, a bigger battle, so something that's more than just a few characters, mm -hmm. then I will draw my own personal battle map just so I understand the sequence of events, who's going where. Uh, so that I don't write somebody out of position or forget about somebody. Um, and it's, but that's for my own personal use. It's very, very rough. Usually I'm just a piece of scratch paper or several pieces as, as I track the, the battle through its progression. Um, but maybe now with JR's idea, I should hold on to those and put them up on my webpage. So, one of the, so I'm writing a book right now. Right here. or, in your, or in your uh, newsletter. Yeah. Newsletter so is one of the things I'm doing, one of the things I'm doing with James Ward, we're writing a book where modern striker unit goes into fantasy Egypt. And so when we were planning one of the battles Ooh, in the first like book, fun. that's already done. Like <laughs> I, I think you're going to like it, Ben. Um, I'm digging it in all of my beta readers. I just readers. love irony that JR's writing it, but he wasn't in a striker unit, but I was. <laughs> that is funny. I was in a striker unit. I'm telling you, I out-processed from a, from a striker unit. Um, <laughs> I just didn't go to war in a striker unit. But <laughs> anyway, so one of the things we did is we drew an actual strip map. I drew it by hand, like what I would have done in the field as an NCO in an infantry unit, because that's how my brain thinks. And one of the things the publisher, which is uh, Wargate Publishing, suggested was actually digitizing that, because that's the kind of thing you can even add. And it looks it, it looks even cooler if it looks like it was actually drawn as a sketch map by the soldiers as you yeah. throw it in as an insert, the yeah, same well, way people will do like faux newspapers. Ability, I'm sure. I mean, it's it's, it's squiggles. They'll probably have to get an artist to make it look even more readable. But. I mean, Jr.'s headshot was paid for. <laughs> it is what it is. Um, but yeah, so I think there's there's value in, in all kind, not, not just like the glorious world maps, like you know the Middle Earth map or or what Kate is making in Incarnate. But I think there's value in even the smaller one, even if it's just a sketch map to add to the world, especially if it looks like something the characters themselves would have drawn. So. I mean, yeah, as, 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 as anybody, a reader, that's the sort of thing I, I would love. So I absolutely encourage anybody who's listening to think about that. Of There's a lot of extra ways to get content to readers these days and maybe explore what they are because mm -hmm. that would be awesome. Well, for me, from the editor perspective, um, I, I look at uh, those small scale maps as, uh, once again, what value is being added for the reader. Um, if it's just a little bonus, like, hey, this is where the armies were laid out, but it's not actually necessary to understand uh, the, the, the book, it's, it's more of the bonus, then that's something that you stick as a bonus feature. Um, if it's 
actually necessary to understand uh, the the scene that it's, it's too confusing otherwise uh, or it's it's important to have this image in the back of the reader's mind as the commander is pouring over the battle map uh, then that's a value that happens in the middle of reading the story you could put it where the lit rpg people like to put their character sheets <laughs> where's that yeah well, in the middle of the story, the literally. With digital publishing, with digital publishing, it's so easy to insert something into uh, text that mm -hmm. uh, that a, a large publisher would have balked at, uh, either because it wastes uh, paper or just because it does not fit their formatting guidelines. Mm -hmm. A small press may also be more open to that as well, just because a small press can afford to take certain risks that a large publisher would not go with and vice versa. I think we're uh, starting to see some more publishers understand that um, there's additive value to increasing the production value of, of the actual physical books. And I say this as somebody who was a bookseller at Barnes and Noble for like two and a half years. And some of the books that I saw coming in, you could actually see some of those. And there were people, particularly at the holidays, who literally bought a book just because it was that little extra oomph mm -hmm. in the container. Uh, so if you are a nice, it it had nice. publisher listening, please hear this. We haven't really talked about the art of maps a lot. And mm -hmm. for me, because I don't put them into my books, they aren't a part of how I experience books, really. I don't look at maps for, for detail when I'm reading. That's not mm -hmm. how I read. But I take maps in as an art and as a texture and as a characterization of a story. Mm -hmm. And having a hand-drawn map in the middle of a story that, uh, that, that your officer would have drawn characterizes that story, even if yeah. none of the details are relevant. Yeah. But it gives you such a depth of detail just that a single image has so much ability to characterize something. Um, the the type of stonework that you use in the the, the de decoration around the corners of the map and is there a dragon on it that tells you everything you need to know. Yeah, um, a map yeah. will show you the character of the story that you're getting Absolutely. into. Absolutely, and yeah. and the details can. There's there's a story I read somewhere about MIT did an analysis on a planet in a sci-fi book and given the orbit of the planet and the length of the day and all this stuff the planet would have come to a peak at the middle uh -huh. because it was spinning so fast. Yeah. And I feel like that with my maps. <laughs> I am not trying to get these things technically accurate. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to say it is that way, friend. We're going that way. How far, <laughs> I don't know. We're going to find oh, out when we get there. We that's call those at Dragon Con the uber uber fans like <laughs> like i'm just a regular level uber fan on some of these things like the mercedes lackey stuff but some of these people um, i, I right? will it, i <laughs> will admit insane. to having a they will create your next level. checked david weber's math <laughs> are you part of view nine no i am not I, am I, not. I can I can so, set you up with some of those people i happen to know some so there was a so I can't one of the things Go ahead, JR. I say one of the things that um, that I do you do notice is that there's some universality to both building design and the the way things are that that people sometimes don't realize. And I'll give you an example. I wrote a story. Uh, my reservist was in the Galaxy's Edge. That map that I drew, I actually just sketched out in general the idea of this is what the fort would look like based on these terrains. And when I gave it to the guy that actually made the map that went in the book. He's like, yeah, because uh, he's he's from England. He's like, yeah, that's a castle in Wales. I've been there twice. And he like inserted the map. And it wasn't my intention. I'd never heard of this place. Yeah. Certainly couldn't spell it because, you know, Welsh. Uh, but like sometimes form really does follow function. Yeah. yeah, a few apostrophes and weird letters. Yeah. I think they're just messing with yeah. us. Like they probably speak differently. <laughs> and this is just a giant like troll, right? They're just messing with us. Okay, yeah, so, you know, just, just a little linguistic joke for you that uh, in the English began... Uh, as German spoken with Welsh grammar. There's a reason why there aren't a whole lot of Welsh words that wound up in English. No one could spell them, even in Old English. <laughs> oh, no. That's not the... There used to be a shirt, and I would see it every so often at cons, that was English is the language that's, like, basically beat up, dragged you back, in yeah. the, and 
English follows right. other right. languages. Right. 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 Another one. It started as a bad habit between uh, Saxon invaders and um, and Welsh milkmaid. We thought if they could share one bad habit, they could share others. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you know, right, back to match, back to match. We got to tag it on something Chloe said earlier. Uh, I, I can't remember what it is. It's uh, but she she sparked a memory of a movie scene or a TV show where you know they're they're trying to plan out what's going on and they're just grabbing like this random stuff that's around this house and putting it on the table. Like you're the bottle cap and you're this and you're that. And and you know one guy's like no 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 I don't want to be this I want to be that right and, and they start arguing about that back and forth so if you could have that kind of map or that kind of scene in your mm -hmm. book with them that kind of map you know that actually shows like yeah you know, this guy's a bottle cap and this guy's a ballpoint pen cap and so on and so forth yeah mm -hmm. I think that would certainly add to the character of your story and I think it's something that the reader would love to see. Mm -hmm. We actually had a lieutenant when I was in Iraq that brought GI Joes that he used in the, <laughs> to plan no. the battle and they no. had people. Oh like no! Two, two NCOs. Oh my like, God! We're to, the are amazing. We had to work You're with such good cannon fodder. Sorry. <laughs> we had to work with some some foreign nationals, and language barriers were an issue. And the translators could only be so reliable because we couldn't understand if they were making up or lying. So he's like GI Joe, and then these two Rangers that we were working with started literally fist fighting over who got to be what GI Joe <laughs> in the depiction of what he was. And I'm like. I don't know if this means that the G.I. Joe matters or they'll fight over anything, but I mean that stuff really oh. happens <laughs> over real maps. I mean, that takes where did the where did you where did they touch you on the doll to a whole new level? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Poor so, Kate, she's so young um, and innocent. She's like, I'm not going there. <laughs> so speaking speak. <laughs> It's probably for the best. <laughs> Your preacher might not like it if he hears you talking about that one. Um, so getting back to maps, do you guys find value in, in smaller maps or actually of like what the building looks like and layouts of the buildings or the ships? Do you do you use those when you when you write? I certainly have it in my head for every building I ever build. Um, I It's a funny thing. The, the, the way that I write, I open a door and see what's on the other side. And going into every building that I write in, I know the layout of that building. And I go back and edit or I go back into that building later in the series and the same building exists again. But I don't ever draw those. Those are those are just a, a mental picture that I use for choreography. Yeah, only only if it's if it's necessary again to track the action, track the characters. You know, the, the climactic battle in my book, uh, it you know, it's a, it's inside a space station. And it, it goes through several different sections of the station, and some of the characters are in different sections. So I, again, sketch maps you know, on, on the side, just so I keep track of who's where and 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 where the bad guys are, so that uh, I can keep the flow going in the story. But the, again, not not something that's publishable. So I've actually tracked one book that was a sci-fi book and I won't name and shame, but I'm just going to say that I sketched out as the action was happening because, you know, the, the grunt in me never went away. And I realized that in order for that book to work as he wrote it, half the ship's exposed to vacuum and they're running around just in space because the ship didn't actually meet if they made all the turns the way they say they did. And the only get out of jail free card is if he says, oh, they were unreliable narrators, but that's just cheating. <laughs> it's not like books are the only ones that have that problem, you know, back when the world Any was young, and, and I used to, I used to play video games all the time. You know, the, the final level of Halo is this, you know, you, you drive this, this warthog, right. this, this Jeep, you know, imitation through, 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 through a ship, through this giant ship. And then somebody went and took the, like, here's the image of the ship they used in the game. And here's the path. And they showed how the path didn't follow the layout of the ship even at all. So <laughs> huge, huge about... video game studios that do things with, with enormous budgets can't get that right either. So, Star Trek yeah, Enterprise. Everybody, everybody has that problem. No kidding. Yeah, so, I mean, it's really good. The in, Enterprise in has one bathroom. Here <laughs> 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 it's So it's really good it's in, really in nonfiction. Big, and and, and JR can carry through to what you're talking about. So this is one of my favorite nonfiction books. It's uh, written by one of the only on, surviving. The okay, it's written by only by the uh, the only surviving uh, destroyer captain from the Japanese Navy in World War II. It's his his memoirs of the battle, and it's got detailed battle maps hmm. like this, showing the positions of the different ships at the different times. Hmm. So I think oh, yeah, this you, is something you that would have appeal. that sort of thing in a book like that. Yeah, yeah, and 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 this yeah. is. 
you know, this is something that I think, you know, modern mill sci-fi should uh, should uh, aspire to if you're going to have really complicated action, right? Yeah, it's, it's, genre it's genre it's matters, guy right? Versus guy, but yeah. Well, yeah, no, different genres have, have different requirements for maps. Like sometimes you can be a little bit like, hey, it's it's a direction. And other times a bit like, yeah. no, I need to see the order of battle and who went where. And like, like I've got a uh, Janissaries from Jerry Pornell you know, over here on the shelf. And it's, it's got you know, like old school style battle maps with like, here's the, you know, here's the order of battle and here's everybody laid out and here's the arrows and here's mm -hmm. the terrain. Yeah. You know, like that kind of book needs that kind of a map, you know, which is, very much so, similar to those those military memoirs other kinds of books so just to show what i don't need it yeah so just to show you what a nerd doc was when we did the solo layout of mike's uh, room she's like judging his bookshelves and like scanning what the titles are so just so you know she's no, one of those no but, it's even worse it's not even that it's the title it's that i recognize the back of the book <laughs> some of them are very just distinctive. the spine but, are, yeah no it's, well, it's one of the things though, the back of the book and it's the color combination i can see that he has air, arrows of the queen there and uh, by the sword both by mercedes light and he's like that by yeah. the sword that's a very distinguished uh title or spine and 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 i mean it's a gorgeous gorgeous uh painting yeah and Carol it looks like you have the there. owl's night trilogy next to it yeah that's yeah that's, nope that's, i am that person I, i'm i'm organized that's, that's so, all my mercedes light so what one of the things that people don't realize, especially when you're designing world maps, is how much like logistics matter, right? Armies don't, they march on their bellies, as Napoleon famously said. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things to consider, though, when you when you design those maps is, is how people are going to move. Because if you can't factor that in, certain things can't happen. The angry staff officer I've referenced into a lot of times is a podcast where staff officers, because they're angry because they're not grunts anymore, who are trained logisticians by virtue of being infantry officers will break down all kinds of sci-fi and fantasy movies. And let's just say the uh, George R. R. Martin's uh, Game of Thrones, at least as it was portrayed on the screen, they tore that up about everything that was wrong with it because logistically it just wasn't possible. There was no way they could feed that force that size. Ooh, puppy. They could feed a force that size on the train. Like, like that's all stuff to consider. When you're when you're laying out your map is yeah. also not just like where everything is what could it support because mm -hmm. if it's desert i mean you're you're only gonna you're gonna be a population cap unless you've got modernity yeah so do you guys factor that in when you when you do your maps or do you just oh pretty picture i factor that in the world building so once the world is built and then the story is moving forward from that point i'm referencing then the map that I've already made and I don't change it. Um, so if that answers your question for my end, at least. No, I, when I build- What about you? I, I, I've done world hopping sci-fi where I'm building a new planet every two or three chapters. It's exhausting. But I start with a water cycle and I start with rocks and I put a place in orbit and I know how long the year is and the tilt of the, the axis and, and all of these things go into building. Where does the food come from? Where does the water come from? What are the, the ways that the different cultures and different parts of the planet are going to relate to each other because of who has resources and how are those resources divided up? And all of that is a big piece. It's a huge lift in creating a new place. But that is how I get the bones of a place that feels organic as you put the culture and the people on top of it trade and money and water and and all of these things are so core to how culture works and then you put people in there who tap dance on top of it and it's ridiculous <laughs> sounds like a lot of fun to me it's so much fun <laughs> so ben have you ever i don't know if you're a gamer or not but you said you play oh, video yeah. games you ever play tabletop where you've had to build your own worlds I have done a little bit of that. Yeah, you know, I mean, there's there's a pretty clear link. You know, I mean, just you know, knowing if you know anything about the origin of tabletop role playing games and books like this and maps, I think all of that stuff kind of goes together. You know, it's got a very natural relationship. And yeah, I've I've certainly made made that sort of thing. You know, something I did recently is I'm you know hoping to teach my 11 year old 
to play D and D, and so I I made a red wall setting for him Ooh. because he loves the red wall books. Okay, and great so for just, teaching math. Yeah, I just laid that out in a map, and like he loves the mapping part. Like I can give him some graph paper and be like, "Hey, buddy, you want to make a map?" And he'll be like, "Yes." And he like he he's <laughs> it, it's so fun to see him do those sort of things. It's it's really enjoyable. So yeah, like that sort of thing is a very natural outgrowth of liking books like that and oh i want to go make my own maps this is this is a lot of fun oh okay here's some graph paper have fun so if you get your kids involved in your hobby it's no longer an addiction dear listener it's bonding i just want you yes. to know that you can quit at any time graph That's paper on right. hand Families. And honestly, I think it's important too, as adults, as some as someone who's barely an adult, honestly. But as adults, in general, I'm, I'm an adult. Um, I, Damn it, I'm an adult. I am. I think it's. I think it's important to not forget that childlike wonder when building maps. To not get so focused on all the the particulars and what has to happen. And let yourself enjoy the map you're making because it is so much fun. And I see people get so mad at other people when something isn't right. And sometimes, you know, as you as we pointed out many times, maps are not always right. There are oftentimes a lot of stuff that gets messed up. <laughs> and that's okay. It's it's especially in fantasy or sci-fi, it's not real. And it's okay. It's fun. Well, you know? One of my favorite uh, experiences uh, when uh, combining social media and map making is that there's a particular uh, Facebook forum that uh, I'm in uh, that I actually haven't seen a whole lot from recently, come to think of it. So the almighty algorithms are apparently deciding that I don't get to see that right now. But um, I, I always love to, to see those arguments of uh, someone commenting on someone's maps like, oh, well, Geography doesn't work that way. And then someone comments, well, here's a real life example where it does. Oh, is, is that the one where they have that whole argument about rivers? That's one that will pop up a lot. All sorts of stuff. I've never seen I actually saw the best as weird as a real map. It's true. Like it's, it's almost true. impossible so to make a real yeah, to make a fantasy map that's as weird as real world geography. It's, one, it's just like yeah. history is always weirder than any story you can write. Like who could make up that story about the Rangers fighting over the GI Joes? Yeah, there, there was one <laughs> real life one. Uh, it was down in uh, Louisiana, Lake Pont Poncha, Pont Lake Pontchartrain. Yeah, Pontchartrain. yeah, and and a and a fantasy map builder, like a professional one. He looked at this. And he's like, I wouldn't do this. I wouldn't do this. I would. Who who designed this map anyway? Who did this? <laughs> Mother Nature. <Yeah. laughs> there is there's something I, I actually tell, saw. There's something I will tell authors all the time, but I only recently found out was actually a Mark Twain quote that real life has an advantage over fiction. Fiction has to make sense. That yes. and yeah, and Tom Clancy yes. the same thing. Tom Clancy and Mark Twain. Because I shared that with you, Jr. last time, I believe, right? Yeah. It was Tom Clancy and Mark Twain both used that quote, and I love it. It's one of my favorites. I Speaking of the people arguing semantically, at a certain point in time, you just, as a reader, have to hit the I believe button and go with the story because it's fun. But it. one of the fandoms that I was uh, observing from afar, I try not to get too deep because some of those people are crazy, yo. Um, but one of them, they had mentioned that geography doesn't work that way and the river was flowing the wrong direction. So the author just commented, you're absolutely right. There was a magical curse. I haven't written that story yet. And it just shut everything down. Because <laughs> fantasy, why not? I love it. Magic. I was like, I got to take lessons. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think so. Um, Sometimes we lose that ability to just say, you know what? I'm just going to sit back and enjoy the ride. Mm -hmm. um, at one point I had to correct somebody and they're like, that doesn't work. And I'm like, you do know you're, you're talking about bubble guppies, right? <laughs> you have been spared that phenomenon. It is a like snorkels or something basically for this current generation of children and I had to literally turn around and look at them and go, because planes really work underwater. And yeah, no. Sometimes my poor, though, you've got to. My poor ex sister in law got totally made fun of by me by it. Yeah, and, and I'm actually because so, I, I am a a developmental editor. I'm there helping people with world building, so it's actually my job to try to make it work as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Which will actually cause some authors to look at me and when it look at me really funny when I say, "Oh yeah, you can hand wave that one." It's like, what? <laughs> I can? Yep. 
Mm -hmm. now, the, the only genre I really hold to that stuff is hard science fiction. If mm -hmm. you're going to go deep into hard, crunchy science fiction, you got to get it right. And, and you, when, you have to expect it, to be and, honest. And when your characters jump off of a 10-story building on a tiny moon and injure themselves on the landing, I'm going to mock you to my friends. <laughs> But I think they honestly they they bring it on themselves. It's like watching the PhD yeah. student who drunkenly put pontificates, forgetting that like dihydrogen monoxide is just called water. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. No, other than that, I selective, may have seen selective uh, uh, indulgence of of fantasy is just silly. You go with it, man. That's why we're here in the first place. Howard Taylor you know, had a, a great phrase uh, uh, that uh, your suspenders of disbelief are there to hold up your pants of reality. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> I like that one. So, all right. Well, we've been at this for an hour and we could probably keep going with, with uh, funny anecdotes, but you know, we've all got day jobs and kids to deal with and life happens. So we're going to have to start wrapping some this up. some of us are even if married. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things. Adorable children. One of the things that. Uh, Doc behave. So one of the things that uh, we like to do as we wrap it up is first to remind you, if you had questions and you want us to bring the panel back with specific questions, we are happy to do that. And we've all had fun. So like if, if there's something you think we missed that we need to talk about, message us in the comments. But with that being said, uh, before we let you go, we're going to ask everybody to uh, to tell us what they're reading right now. And we're going to start with you uh, in the top right corner, Mr. Benjamin. Ooh. Uh, I was just today reading volume five of Peter Nealon's The Lost Series, which I imagine you should be familiar with, JR, which yes. has a map in it. Although I frequently feel angry because in the ebook version, it doesn't zoom and it bothers me. <laughs> it should. How rude. That, I'm that, very, that is very actually disappointed. very understandable. Yeah, so I mean, you know, and then because this is recon, how recon marines shooting demons, you know, what's not to like, right? And just because we yeah, absolutely, and just because we want to bust reality, we're going to go counterclockwise. So we're going to go to Matt next. What are you reading? Okay, well, fiction. Yeah, this. I know the moon that and one. the desert. Yeah, sure. I know the author. Yep. Actually, uh, I, this was a, a, a gift from him, um, so it's it's all signed and everything. Nice. Um, nice. And then for nonfiction, there's this one. Hmm. Okay. This one's actually research nice. uh, for uh, for the book that I'm writing right now, uh, which is a, a a partially hard science, partially totally not uh, space opera. It's it, I'm I'm. Just treading a line in there. Uh, there, there are some things that are more hard than uh, and and than not, and uh, I, I can't get into that right now. Not the right podcast, but I, I I've been kind of feeling what uh, Chloe was just saying. Hold it together, Doc. <laughs> I can see the wheels Hold turning. Together, Doc. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Docs are I didn't Doc, say what are you reading? <laughs> Doc, what are you reading? I am reading From the Ashes by Christina Gruel, who we've had on the podcast. She's a nice lady. I like her. I she am reading is. two She's books. The one so I'm who reading the coffee uh, stain map I mentioned earlier. And if you've got gluten intolerances or dairy allergies and all the things, she's got some of the awesomest recipes for you to try if you've got issues. I'm just saying, she's a good friend to have. She cooks. You have lots of issues. My mother has celiac. <laughs> yeah. So. If you've got issues, I'm just saying her author forum oh. on Discord where all her fans follow her, they also talk food. So it's a good place to hang out. Oh, Unless no. you're hungry, then maybe oh, not so much. Yeah. Um, so I am reading A Call Sign Valkyrie by Walt Robillard uh, in the uh, Galaxy's Edge uh, universe. And then I am, because we're going to do a review on it. And then I'm reading on the nonfiction side, Discovering the faces, the New Faces of Neurodiversity, Unmasking Autism. And I think it's Devin Rice or Price. I can't remember. But it's um, nonfiction. So, real exciting. All right, and next, because we're going counterclockwise and I can read a clock, I think. Kate. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I um, am currently working my way through Brandon Sanderson because I had never read his stuff before. Okay, um, so, so you're going to be like 35 by the time you've- I know, I know. I'll get there. Which is why I'm not just, I'm not just like, 
bold no, he, for it. I'm taking my time with it. Um, so while I'm reading, I'm currently I started with um his sci-fi Skyward. So I'm currently reading that. Okay. So, um, and I figured I'd work from there to Mistborn, and then eventually work into the Stormlight Archives. We'll get there. They're all on the shelf. No we'll joke. My favorite um, fiction book of all time is Elantros. Uh, that and one there is, is a very specific yeah. reason for that. Not only is it a brilliant book, but I'm also, I, I am handicapped with chronic pain. And when I read it, I was literally sitting in a wheelchair. When you get to a certain point, you will probably understand why I cried. I'm very excited. I'm very excited. I to love that book. You should talk to me about it. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll make it happen. Um, but I, I'm also All reading right. to you guys because this has a beautiful map as well. This was sent to me as like a um, to help promote the book, but I'm absolutely loving it. It's like a epic fantasy. I don't know how to pronounce her name. Heroes of the Empire, the Cavalier. Right. The book. And it is. Hold on. Because the cover is so pretty, oh, can yeah. you? It's I'm gorgeous. putting you in the solo. Okay, move your fingers. Published. Put your so fingers sorry. on the side. Yes. There it is. Sarah, that is awesome. Let me show you, me show you the like, map in solo. I got to show oh, you. Oh, 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 let me get you back on the solo screen if there's a map. She has, absolutely. She, well, she has a pronunciation guide as well, which absolutely loved. And here's, she made with Incarnate. I don't know. I don't know if she made it. It is an Incarnate map, though, because I know Incarnate like the back of my okay. hand. <laughs> right. But I opened up and said, oh, that's Incarnate. But I'm very much enjoying this right now, which I'm very happy about because, you know, okay. sometimes you get sent books and it's okay. But this one is, I'm liking it. So outstanding. All right. And next, um, we've got Mr. Mike Morton. What are you reading? All right. So for fiction, uh, I'm in the process of writing a book for the Four Horsemen Universe by CKP. So uh, continuing my research, I'm reading uh, The Executioners by Jason Cordova and Matt Novotny. Uh, nonfiction, uh, buried at work with various uh, unfortunate uh, papers and other things. But uh, uh, I'm uh, also enjoying Larry, Larry Correa's uh, In Defense of the Second Amendment. Mm. Okay. And uh, last but not least, Miss Chloe, what are you reading? Um, the last series that I just finished out was Lee Bardugo's Six of Crows. Oh, yes. Hard. <laughs> okay. Shadow and Bone was good. It made me want to read those books. And oh, I know no, they, no. Uh, they changed. You, you gotta you gotta check out season two. We can do an entire episode on season two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just binge watched it. I didn't sleep last night. Dude, I, I have you. not binge watched it. I'm refraining because I have so much other stuff I need to get done. I'm watching the show, but I read all the books like last year. Six of Crows was my favorite of all of hers. I oh, love Six of Crows. I, I, I love the love it. It's so good. It. Mm -hmm. so and the show's doing a great job, honestly. To be honest, yeah. I the show, the as show. hard as it is to believe, the books are still better than the show. And the book, the show, is phenomenal. I've it's really cool. appreciated the way the show has handled the storytelling. Mm -hmm. It's been really well managed for getting all of these characters onto the, the same screen and, and letting them breathe. It is, but it's been a really neat. Adaptation. I've loved their casting as well. Oh, it's yeah. perfect. And the ben cast Bonas, really does. Covers on the side. I love him so much. <laughs> that and Prince Caspian. That was my dude. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I just had to look up what you guys were talking about. You were at the time. I will take a look at this uh, because if, you, if all you guys are saying that's good, then I should. Oh no, it, it is. Oh, so good. And when you read all of the books, you feel this sense of completion that I don't normally feel when I finish a series. They're they're well done. Like yeah. it, it's like completion, but not book close. Like you can tell she could go back. But at the same time, if she never goes back to those characters again, you're still happy. Mm hmm. That's and the magic really system. I, I fell in love with the magic system of that world. I think that oh, was very dude. well done. As someone who loves building magic systems, it is very well in the uh, what oh. by tying back to this topic, the map of that world mm -hmm. is very important to the storytelling of that mm -hmm. world. Yeah. Absolutely. Because it, it shapes how the culture has and how the generations have reacted mm -hmm. to things. It's hugely important. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like Doc just volunteered us to do a review episode of Shadow and Bones, both the TV and then maybe later the books. 
so stay tuned. We'll have to get that on the calendar. And, uh, and maybe some of these same guests will be back. I'll, I'll, hey, uh, I'll you love it when you we'll, get we'll volunteers for things. Why did you join the army? <laughs> what are you talking about? We've had this on since season one came out that we were going to do this episode and just life happened. So it's, it's, it's a long time coming. No, uh, I you think had we'll a have life. Do... I did not. <laughs> because. Well, we weren't going to judge, but. Because Doc is not married. Because <laughs> Doc is terminally single and really prefers it that way. <laughs> Well, All the jokes said, about not uh, being terminally single are by me, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. every, when that sign so, has been posted that up. changes so much, too. <laughs> <laughs> it's me doing so, it. So we want to end on a on a positive note. So I'm going to send you to the internet's awesomest places and I'm going to let all of our guests tell you where to find them. So at the, uh, we're going to go, you know, clockwise this time. Cause I do know how to read a clock. I'm going to start with you, Matt. So where, where can they find you on the interwebs? Uh, novel uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, it hasn't been updated in a while, but it will be soon. Um, there is a lot of writing advice on there. So if you are a writer and you want to know more about things, or if you're a reader and you want to know more about how the sausage is made, um, there's uh, there's some stuff on there. And I promise it's a lot prettier than watching sausage get made. <laughs> I think we all read that story back in high school. It was kind of brutal. No, I anyway, actually feel how uh, they showed us. Ooh. Yikes. All right, Ben. Pass. You can find my website at benespen.com. I've got a recently revamped website with a new hosting provider, and I launched all sorts of fun new features like newsletters and improved commenting. So there's a, a lot of fun stuff there. I've got a couple of hundred book reviews in the archive. So go check it out. Absolutely. All right. And Chloe, where can they find you on the interwebs? I am Blender Fiction on WordPress. I It's a, a, an image of taking all of the stories that I've got going on in my head and just shredding them up and see what comes out. So that's where I, I keep up with what I've got going on and how to get in touch with me through newsletters and other services that way, too. Outstanding. All right, Mike. Okay, so you can find me on Facebook, uh, Michael Morton, or you can also find me at the Command Post, where we talk about our books that are in in work and converse with the fans. Uh, and you can find my uh, Amazon author page, uh, where all of my works that are currently in print are listed. All right, and last but certainly not least, Miss Kate. Um, you are going to find me at Writer Kate K on Instagram and TikTok. I believe it's on Facebook as well. It should be the same. Um, I post book reviews, I post maps, I post incarnate tutorials, uh, quotes from my writing, um, and my website, I think it's still acting up a little bit when you go to search for it, but you can find the link to that in the bio of Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, it's all right there. So you can click that link, it'll take you to my website, where you can actually commission me to make a map, I will do it happily. <laughs> All right. And you can find us on all the cool places, but let me tell you exactly where those are. We are on Twitter at www. I'm joking. Twitter.com backslash SF underscore fantasy underscore show. Again, Twitter.com backslash underscore uh, Sierra Foxtrot underscore fantasy underscore show. Wow. It's getting too late and I have not had enough coffee. Uh, <laughs> but, but all of it will be linked in the show notes. You can email us at blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com. Again, blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com. I promise I even answer those emails and sometimes doc does too. If you get really happy when you read it, cause it was super polite. It wasn't doc. Uh, <laughs> we have a Facebook group <laughs> where all the shenanigans happen. Uh, at facebook.com backslash groups backslash blasters and blades podcast again backslash groups backslash blasters and blades podcast we have a website where you can follow us over at anchor.fm backslash blasters dash and dash blades again blasters tack and tack blades uh, anchor.fm blaster backslash blasters tack and tack blades where you can support the show for as little as 99 cents a month you can help keep the lights on or you could support the show more directly over at buymeacoffee.com backslash author jr hanley again buymeacoffee.com backslash author jr hanley and uh you can uh, help keep the lights on and i promise if you put in the in the show notes or in the show notes 
man, it's late. This is why we don't pre-record this because the mess ups are almost more fun than sometimes the, <laughs> but uh, if you put in the notes that it's for the podcast, I promise I will keep my co-host Doc Saska and Nick Garber. I promise we will have proof of life coming soon. He is still here, but uh, I will keep them duly caffeinated. They will drink until their liver explodes. Never! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Thank you for joining us. All right. On- no, I was, I was like, I finally made it through, and I only butchered it like a million times. I know. I was trying to listen and be polite and li- let you speak finish. <laughs> okay. Thank you for joining us. Uh, on behalf of the absentee Nick Garber, the adult brain JR, and whatever I am tonight, um, this was the Blasters and Blaze podcast. We'll be back next week, same time, same place, enjoying our crazy love of nerd, nerddom, fandom, and all the geekiness that is wonderful in this world um don't hit yet don't, don't hit it yet so since because we didn't stop talking long enough we didn't show the commercial we'd normally show so for sponsor uh katie has gracious katie i keep saying katie it's kate i promise i can read uh <laughs> don't listen to doc i can read no. she was gracious enough to be the sponsor no. of this episode so we will link you to her where you can buy her commissioned art because it's too awesome not to have you gaze at the pretty pictures all right <laughs> JR loves to communicate in pictures, so please go support Katie. Because <laughs> JR needs more things he knows how to read without struggling or sounding out the vowels. <laughs> True story. True story. <laughs> <laughs>